I now have the honor to announce the beginning of the science celebration, for which I will now hand over to the chief commercial officer from Cavestro, Suchita Guvita. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is, this is incredibly special, being here at the K-Fair 2019. And for me, the reason why it's so special is because it is the seat of innovation, uh, celebrating science and scientists to provide the solutions for all the challenges that occur today, but more importantly, the challenges that occur in the future. And as Carl said, uh, we are celebrating something really important. Uh, at the science fair. And for that, I'd like to welcome all of you here, the extended Covestro family, members of academia, our partners, and of course, our internal employees, which include the core and the heart of innovation, our scientists. Fundamentally, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, a 16-year-old girl captured the imagination of the world by daring the world and saying, let's unite behind science. It's time we listen to the scientists. And for Covestro, that comes actually quite naturally. We have been listening to our scientists for quite a long while. I have personally had the fortune in the two and a half months that I've been here to meet only a few members of the scientific community. And I have been so incredibly impressed with what they have to offer. Because the challenges are many. And as Carl said, a lot of them have very conflicting objectives. Keep producing more, but do it with less energy. Keep solving for functional benefits, but make sure we don't harm the environment. And whilst these are complex and conflicting, we can rely on our scientific community, our scientists, to provide some of these solutions. Solutions which they have perhaps seen even before the layperson in the world can. And they work tirelessly to provide those solutions. So in that regard, today I'm really thrilled that we celebrate two things. First, the science medal, which goes to members of the internal Covestro community, pioneers who work tirelessly on solutions above and beyond their core expertise. And number two, the science award, because all of us know that none of us are individually that smart. We need to rely on people outside of the ecosystem that we work in, people in academia, open innovation. And that is the Science Award, which goes to early stages of fundamental research, which will solve for problems in the future. So I'm really pleased to celebrate, along with all of you, these two, the Science Medal and the Science Award. It's a really incredible and important moment, and we do this at K2019. So first, the science medal. And really, you know, I feel incredibly humble as I stand here today, and it is an incredible honor as well to celebrate this. I am resting on the hard work that has been done on five individuals who have worked, as I said, tirelessly above and beyond their day jobs to get to this. And I'm going to say their names right now, and then in a few minutes, just a few minutes, invite them up on stage. So these five individuals who are experts in their fields in chemistry, engineering, and of course business as well, are Dr. Rainer Weber, Andreas Bulan, Mikhail Grossholz, Raina Helmish, and Giorgio Dolfini. Could I have a big hand for them, please? Thank you on their behalf. They'll soon be up on stage, and you'll get to see them firsthand. But a little bit about what they've done. So as Carl mentioned, you know, um, and for those who worked in the industry, you know this better than I do, that a large proportion of what Covestro produces today is reliant on chlorine. And chlorine is incredibly 
uh, energy consuming, like ele electricity consuming. So imagine the challenge that is po posed to them. We are continuing to grow, we will grow, that's in our DNA. But hey, can you do this with a little less electricity consumption? Can you keep producing more with a little less? And so 25 years ago, give or take, they started working on this. They started working on groundbreaking technology. And I have to get this word correct, ODCs. They started working on ODCs, oxygen depolarizing cathodes. I think the test was put. <laughs> yeah, I said that. I said that without tripping over. And it wasn't just the process. They had to work with the raw materials. They had to make sure that it worked in a plant scale, but also at an industrial scale. And what is, what is so incredible is that now we are at that stage where we can apply it to our chlorine alkali production at Tarragona with the promise that we will be consuming 25 to 30% less electricity. And that, in a way, is also environmental friendly. So it meets a lot of our internal objectives, but for the world, it also meets a lot of the external objectives and the challenges that are faced, that we face. Uh, of course, we have to work internally. We also have to work with some of the external partners, and that makes it uh, very rewarding to us at every possible field. And it's not just what we can do today, but the applications for the raw materials that we can work in the future. So for me, it's a really special honor and a privilege to present this award. And may I now call upon stage the five members. One of them is uh, unfortunately unwell and may not be able to join. So four members are here. And of course, the fifth member will also be honored. So Dr. Rainer Weber, Andreas Bulan, Mikhail Grossholz, Rainer Helmisch, and Giorgio Dolfini. Please, may I invite you on stage? Please. Hello. Oh, oh, that's me. Yeah. Okay. Congratulations. Congratulations. It's an honor to present this. As always, we need proof that they got it. Yeah. Uh, and for that, we need you to uh, be rearranged slightly, don't we? Ah. Yes. If it, yeah. It's gold, it only sort of bends. It, it doesn't break. <laughs> it's not wrong. Is that okay for you? Excellent. Closer. Smile. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Excellent. You. Thank you very much. Your applause. You. And may I now invite. And now Andreas will explain the incredibly important work, the incredibly revolutionary work to all of us. Yeah. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you for your kind introduction. So um, we are here on a plastic fair, and uh, um, my talk is about chlorine. And uh, the question I think you are wondering about is the, the topic, what has chlorine to do with plastic? I hope I could show you this during my talk, how important chlorine is for the chemical industry. And I would also give you an answer if it is possible to make the chlorine pr production a little bit more efficient. So if you look, uh, what happens with the chemical industry? What, 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 are, what are we doing? We're taking raw materials and convert it to chemicals. And out of the chemicals, the products were manufactured of our daily life. And to do this in a very efficient way, we take chlorine uh, for your synthesis for our synthesis. Why is it so important to take chlorine? Because the chemistry with chlorine could be done in a very efficient way. And this is ref reflected in the fact that 60% of all chemical products which are produced need chlorine during the manufacturing process. So the chlorine is a backbone of the chemical industry. Uh, <coughs> it is the engine, I call it the engine of the chemistry. And also for Covestro, like mentioned before, it is a very important raw material. 80% uh, of our products depends on chlorine, um, and the chlorine manufacturing is done by an electrolysis process. This is a very energy-intensive process, 
and we need a lot of electricity. And you can see that 60% of our electricity of Covestro is used only to produce chlorine. So the question is, how could we reduce this, energy, this specific energy demand? And if you look to the past, or to the history of chlorine, uh, you can see that 100 years ago, the chlorine became industrial scale and importance, and there was a, the, uh, the manufacturing was done by uh, dia diaphragm or uh, mercury electrolysis. Then in the 80s, they were developed the, the membrane technology with the ion exchange membranes, and during the last 40 years, this technology was improved and optimized so that you can now save 30% of energy. So the question was, what else could we do to reduce the energy demand? And our idea was to bring fuel cell technology into the electrolysis, and this is called the ODC technology, oxygen depolarized cathode, it's a part of the fuel cell, which was integrated in the chloralkali electrolysis. And by this technology, we are able to save a little bit more of 25% of energy. That means that uh, compared to the past, we are able to produce a double amount of chlorine with the same amount of electricity. So how, how, how does this work? Uh, for the electrolysis, we use common salt, rocket salt, sodium chloride. You know it from your breakfast. You put it on your eggs, water and electricity. And the electrolysis works in this way that you put in, the, you have two chambers, uh, anode and a cathode, you put in the one chamber uh, sodium chloride, and in the other chamber water, you put on elec uh, electricity and you get chlorine, caustic and hydrogen out of, the system, out of your cell. It happens at three volt. Now if you want to save energy, then you remove the hydrogen forming uh, cathode, put in an ODC an electrode, and the additional raw material, it is oxygen, and by this, you get the same product, but without water or hydrogen. You keep it in your mind, it's a very important fact. But you can reduce the cell voltage about one volt. The ODC itself is a very has a very complex structure <coughs> because it must be gas and liquid tight. So oxygen must come in, uh, water must come in, and the products have to be released out of, the, out of this structure. So you, and you have to operate an electrocatalyst. You have also to bring the electrons to the point of the reaction. So what was the big challenge in the development of the ODC technology? The first, the heart of the technology is the ODC itself. This was our job, we did it, we did it over the last 20 years. And the, this ODC has to be operated, has to be employed, and therefore you need a cell design. And this uh, was uh, developed in cooperation with ThyssenKrupp Ude. So the main challenges for the ODC was that we uh, need a high active electrical conductive electrocatalyst. Uh, then also the gas and liquid tightness is important and the technical size is very important. If you come from the fuel cell, they are working in, in 10 to 10 centimeters in square centimeters, but we have to employ gas diffusion electrodes or oxygen depolarized cathode in square meter ranges because we, we're talking about a basic chemicals which has a scale of 100,000 tons and more. For the electrolyzer, of course, the gas and liquid distribution is needed to employ the ODC and small tolerances to keep the uh, energy consumption low. For both, um, you need materials which are stable under operation because we are operating here with pure oxygen and caustic at high temperatures. So not, of, not a lot of materials are stable in this environment. This is very important for this. And the other point um, is the reliable and stable operation of this technology, because chlorine stands in the value-added chain in front of, and it must be available like electricity coming out of a socket. If there is no chlorine, the, the downstream chemistry will stop, and this is an incredible scenario. So the reliable and stable operation was also a very important point. If we started the development of the ODC nearly 20 years ago, we took the, the, the common technology. It was a silver catalyst uh, supported on carbon material, and we learned during the first uh, months of operation that this kind of electrodes wouldn't be stable because they are consuming not only oxygen, they are also consuming the carbon, which they are exist of. So they were destroyed, the lifetime by insufficient was three to four months, and we need lifetimes up to eight years. So the idea was then, we want to have a carbon-free ODC, and uh, this was 
this was done taking special kind of silver catalysts and take over eight years to develop such kinds of electrode. So what did we do? We, we took a powder process, only catalyst powder, and we, think we, take, we took a precursor. It's a silver oxide and, we, and silver metal and PTFE and mix it together in a dry powder mixer. We call it a reactive mixing process. Out of this, you get again a, a, a powder, which is then applied on the support. We adjust a, a, a defined powder layer, and we press this powder layer um, together with the support with a defined pressing force. And the trick of this is the, the use of a precursor of catalyst. Then during the first startup, you can see the precursor catalyst has a color of, 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 of dark brown. And during the first electricity put on this electrode, the high active electrocatalyst is formed. And you can see it has changed the brown color to the white color. And if this catalyst has changed, the oxygen polarized cathode is now re ready, and we have a high active electrocatalyst working inside the electrode. So after a lot of uh, work done in the lab and the pilot, uh, and we decided in 2011 to build up a demo electrolyzer. And you can see here this electrolyzer at the site of Krefeld Oerding. The capacity was 20,000 tons of chlorine. And it was a success because this electrolyzer runs very stable and the expected electricity savings were realized. <coughs> But we also learned a lot of things, because this is the first electrolyzer worldwide that was employed here at, at, at our site. And uh, we did a lot of improvements. And uh, after these improvements, now we are able to, to operate NACL Generation 2. And this is the technology we come to a world-scale plant at our site in, in Tarragona to be operated there. And we expect there also 25% energy savings and coupled with uh, power manufacturing, a savings of more than 20,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions. This is, a, this is correlated to about the emissions of 15,000 cars per year. So this was done for chlorine. And we have now a lot of ex, uh, expertise gained with, with manufacturing of ODCs, electrolysis, and so on. And uh, we're looking a little bit in the future, what else could we do with such kind of electrode, with gas diffusion electrode. And the main point and the main promise in technology is the power to chemistry. So we use a gas diffusion electrode and a gas, for example, carbon dioxide, and renewable energy, and convert this to, for example, the syngas, or formaldehyde, or methanol, or in this way. So that is a, is, is a big benefit for, for future applications. The other technologies are also very proven uh, because it can use this technology water treatment or purification as in the manufacturing of oxidants or in energy saving and other electrolysis processes. Also in alkaline or metal air batteries is it possible to use it. But if you use it in, in the electrolysis systems, we have two big, big advantages. The one is you save energy and you have an inner end safety because you get no hydrogen in your system. Those are the big advantages. So that's what I want to say. Um, I hope I could show you how important the chlorine is for the chemical industry. And back to the question, could we save 25% of energy? The answer is yes, we can. And I have to thank for your attention and we'll be happy to answer some questions. Thank you very much indeed for this quick introduction into why you really and your team really deserve this science medal. Is there anyone in this audience after this presentation who feels equipped to ask a question? <laughs> I may have phrased it wrong. <laughs> you feel like knowing more? I mean, here's, here's the person, here's the team that actually have spent 20 years? Yeah. I mean, in the beginning, they didn't even have an iPhone to take a picture of the first prototype. This is how long ago this is. So they have amassed a lot of expertise. You said it. So if, if you want to milk them, now is the time. And maybe next time, you stand up here. Doesn't make it any easier, does it? No. <laughs> no. It looks like, at the moment, they've, they're fully satisfied with all yeah. the knowledge that came from you. There's nothing we can add at the moment. So I say, once again, thank you very much. Okay. Congratulations to your and your team. Thank you.
Andreas, that was awesome, absolutely awesome. And I, and I know why people may not have felt like asking questions because, you know, th that, is, uh, that is incredible. And I think people are now just waiting for it to be applied in Tarragona and prove to the world that we can do more with a lot less. So fantastic. Okay, so what happens when that brain power and that groundbreaking work meets with folks outside of Covestro, people outside of Covestro who are, who are also pushing the boundaries and investing in research, fundamental research, groundbreaking research and techniques that help us. And um, for, this is going to happen for the second time in the K Fair, where Covestro honors people in academia um, who have helped us. And the beauty is when things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, meet the world of chemistry and raw material and science. That creates magic beyond what we can ever imagine. And this year, the Science Award highlights a central technique which is predominant to foster some breakthroughs that take into account machine learning, artificial intelligence in the world that we operate in, chemistry and science. And the award goes to a professor who works in the very important area of machine learning, Professor Dr. Newell Washburn. He's developed this at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. It's a fundamental approach which meets chemistry through the intelligent uses of digital in industry. And for us at Covestro, digitalization is incredibly key. We have committed to it. As our CEO, Marcus Tyleman says, anything that can be done digitally should be done digitally. And we are absolutely committed to making this a core driver of success, but also a core driver of sustainability and making sure as we are producing more and more for our customers and meeting no, those needs, we make sure that the environment is hurt less and less and we solve for all the sustainability challenges in the future. A little bit about Professor Washburn. He started his academic career in chemistry at the University of Illinois and Berkeley in California. He followed this up in the University of Minnesota before joining the National Institutes of Science uh, Standards and Technology. He then joined Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh in 2004, where he currently serves as an associate professor with the appointments in departments of chemistry, biomedical engineering, and material sciences and engineering. What is so uh, wonderful for us at Cavestro is that he's also the founder of Ansatz AI. It's a startup focused on the application of machine learning to the field of chemistry. And this is the area where he collaborates with uh, Covestro to apply his hierarchical machine learning to customer-centered products like the areas we operate in, in polyurethane, in foams and coatings. And this, with this, may I invite Professor Washburn up on the stage, and I'd like to award this science award to him along with a three-year funding in the PhD thesis. Congratulations. Thank you. And I think <laughs> Thank you. And of course I could not explain it myself, so <laughs> Professor, over right. to you. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Well, I, I'm, I'm truly honored to be here to uh, to receive this award, um, uh, and so and I appreciate the, all the efforts that we've had with uh, Covestro in Pittsburgh and, and as well as here in Germany. Um, so we were looking. We developed this algorithm at Carnegie Mellon several years ago and have started early work in its application. And so the opportunity to work with Covestro. Um, came along and uh, we felt it would be an excellent opportunity for us to really explore uh, a complex but incredibly useful class of material, which is polyurethanes. And so their polyurethanes have a unique uh, combination of properties, which are shown here. Um, and so, but to, in order 
the ones that we focused on that I'll tell you about today are mostly focused on the mechanical properties, which we're familiar with um, in things like foams, for example, and, and other elastomeric materials. Um, the challenge is to relate the underlying chemistry, which is due to a combination of the isocyanate and the polyol group to form the polyurethane, but we have a large number of, of variables uh, in terms of, beyond looking at the reactive groups here, the isocyanate and the hydroxyl group to form the urethane, um, we have a huge variable space that we need to try and understand and model. And so looking at monomer chemistries, the ratios of them, and the reaction conditions creates a huge parameter space that needs to be uh, modeled. Um, these materials have found their way into high-tech applications, biomedical applications, coatings. Uh, they're all around us. And so what we're trying to do is develop a, a tool for their rational design, where what we're doing is we're not designing for the, ca the composition. Uh, what we're actually designing for the function. And so in this work, we focus, that I'll tell you about today, we focus on a diversity of, of um, of chemical factors. Um, and so the experiments that we did uh, were shown here. Um, and so we have this, what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand this very large parameter space that has a very complex response surface, meaning that you can get a, a wide range of mechanical properties depending on these variables. But we don't want to be doing hundreds or thousands of experiments. Um, and so this, the initial work that we did, we took a much smaller library of isocyanates and, and polyols. Um, and th the general goal of machine learning is to understand the relationship between input variables and output responses by looking at patterns in data. The problem is that the classical techniques require these very large data sets. And so the question was, well, can we use our knowledge of these systems in order to significantly reduce the, um, the data requirements, but then also to, um, uh, to really Im improve the predictions. So um, the, uh, the work that I'm going to show is, is based on this algorithm we developed with my collaborators at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and so, and, and really, again, the, the challenge is, can we work with the, the, the types and the amounts of data that we normally generate during research and development? So the algorithm is shown here. Um, and briefly, the, it, it looks like a standard machine learning algorithm in that the system, again, the algorithm is trying to connect the relationships between the system variables and the system responses. But rather than embedding a black box in the middle, what we do is we actually embed our, both our understanding of how these systems work, but then also all the different types of data that we're generating during the course of research and development. So in trying to model the mechanical properties of polyurethanes, uh, what we do is, is we start with this question, well, how do they work? Um, and the basis for the, the, the broad range of mechanical properties is shown schematically here, where you have, um, due to the differences in the chemistry between the, um, the, the isocyanate, which is often referred to as the hard segment, and the polyol, which is referred to as the soft segment, you get a complex multi-phase structure that forms the material. Um, and so doing, having an ab initio calculation that would predict the properties of these is beyond our current computational techniques. But what we can do is we can take our knowledge of how this works basically by, by saying, well, the factors that really drive the mechanical responses are a combination of the interactions to form this microphase separated domain, um, the, um, the interactions between the chains, and then also the chain architecture. And each one of these things is, the, each one of these factors is something that we can model separately and then allow the algorithm to start to build a, a digital model of how the system works. And so what we've done is we've taken essentially a, 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 an approach that mixes um, counting functional groups to get a sense to start building predictive models of the microphase separation. We've done simple experimental measurements looking at infrared spectroscopy and, and shifts and peaks. And then we've also collaborated with uh, Jim Thompson at Covestro in using some simulations that he has to predict what the chain architecture looks like. And each one of these factors tells us something about how the, um, 
how the microstructure is changing and, and how that will affect the material properties of the system. What the algorithm does, it will take all this information and then start to build predictive models from them. And so the, the, the structure of the algorithm shows, is shown here. And again, what we're doing is we're trying to take our knowledge of these input variables and predict mechanical responses. But now what, what's in the middle is conceptual understanding. This has a couple of advantages. The first is that we can build, build very accurate models based on small data sets. But then also, as I'll show you, we actually can develop some interpretations for what the model is actually telling us. So the, the process to make the samples, these were done in my lab at Carnegie Mellon, um, where we're blending isocyanates and polyols. We're varying the ratios of these two. Um, and then we're controlling solvent and catalyst, and then, and then under constant curing conditions. And ultimately, we have a relatively small library of 18 polyurethane elastomers um, that we're going to use to actually train the algorithm. We start to do a broad survey of the data, just to, and basically what we're seeing here is that knowledge of the strain at break will not allow you to predict something like the stress at break or the ratio of the elastic and the viscous responses to the materials. Um, the algorithm then starts to tell us how it thinks these systems are working. So for example, it, the algorithm believes that is, is making this prediction that the, the stress at, when the sample is breaking is actually dominated by the intermolecular hydrogen binding of these materials. And so what it does is it starts to let us, it, it will try and explain how it works, and we can use that to further refine the model. But interpretation of this is important because what we're really trying to do is develop a design tool. Um, and then in contrast, this ratio of the elastic and the viscous responses is heavily controlled by the, the, material, the, the chain architecture that's forming, um, which is shown here. So finally, in terms of the quantitative performance of it, um, in machine learning, there are a couple of primary tasks that you're doing. The first is that you are training your algorithm, and then you test the algorithm on data that it hasn't seen. And so, what we've done is we did a head-to-head -head comparison of the hierarchical machine learning algorithm with a state-of-the-art black box model for, for machine learning that's, that's used commercially. Um, and what we see is that the training scores are all over 90%, or primarily over 90% for all these different responses. Um, for the data that the algorithm has seen, the training data, and then as well as the data that it, ha it hasn't seen. In contrast, the black box algorithm does not perform as well in the data that it has seen and has a significantly di more difficult time in predicting the responses of, of new samples. And so what this is telling us is that embedding this domain knowledge becomes a very powerful technique um, for, for developing these kind of predictive models for, for material performance. And so at my group in Carnegie Mellon, what we're doing is we're starting to take this into um, it, developing a design tool for incorporating bio-based monomers. And so this is an example of a, um, uh, of a sustainably produced um, bio-based polyol that we're incorporating. And what we're seeing is that um, castor oil has some significant differences in terms of its the possible ultimate elongation, tensile strength, and this, this ratio of, of, of material properties. And we are then going to be using the algorithm to try and design materials using a broader range of, of isocyanates that will allow us to start to replicate the performance that you get in purely synthetic materials. Okay. So I just want to close by um, thanking uh, a really amazing set of collaborators, um, both at Carnegie Mellon. Um, Aditya Menon was the PhD student that started this work. Um, he's now working at Ansatz AI, working with Covestro. Um, Barnabas Pakshos is my machine learning collaborator at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and then Jim Thompson, uh, we, work, we work with significantly in, in, in using his Monte Carlo algorithms for, uh, for predicting chain architecture. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the innovation team at Carnegie Mellon, uh, Covestro, um, uh, Carl Heider, uh, Dave Steppen, Tim Pike, um, uh, and then most of all, Curry Crookston. Um, when we started this work, it felt kind of like a flying leap. Um, we had this idea that we could combine machine learning and knowledge of science and engineering to build these more, more powerful algorithms. But getting the chance to really explore their application in real life has, has been an amazing opportunity. And so I'd really like to thank everyone at Covestro for their, for their help with this. And, and thank you for your attention.
thank you very much indeed for your presentation as well. Now, um, I have a very little uh, psychological experiment. It's also an algorithm. It's an if-then algorithm, and it goes towards the audiences. If you are still sitting here, then you must have a question. <laughs> you see, our algorithms can be wrong. <laughs> or is there anyone who would like to pose a question? Anything that you want to know about machine learning you uh, so far were afraid to ask, but now you feel totally free and optimistic that you get a perfect answer? I guess this is a no. <laughs> okay, then I say thank you very much again to yeah. you as well. Congratulations and have a safe trip back home. So, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the festivities here in our uh, little arena. And while the registered invitees make their way to the celebration dinner via the information point, I kindly ask all the winners back up here and uh, the photographer to have one last picture taken. Of course, when the winner talks to the CEO, you have to wait. I see that. Can we borrow him just for a quick picture? And Suchita, please, as well. If she's still around, she will. Oh, sorry. And of course, your entire team. We're going to drape you around this pretty stage so we have one big last picture with the awards if you want to. It's better to keep them close to your person. There's lots of people who think they are <laughs> something that's a, a giveaway or something. Okay. So, Michael, let me help you. So. <laughs> Can we get them all in one row? Do we, do we need two rows? Okay. Just step a little bit forward. So you're all in the sun. Excellent. Right. Be aware of the Asians that are around. It's interesting how you're, you're so enthralled with this picture-taking business that you totally do not clap. And I don't know why. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> this is last year's winner, if I'm not mistaken, Thermodynamics. Oh, I'm sure. I'm the brain. <laughs> so, uh, yes, uh, it's three years ago that he won, but he still deserves an applause. Don't you think so? <laughs> Excellent. Very kind of you. Perfect. Well done. Thank you very much. Have a great day. See you tomorrow.